welcome to the Salvation Army this morning. It's really, really nice to have you here on this not-so-nice winter Sunday morning, but here we are in the Lord's house, and it's really lovely to see your faces. I'm not going to say any more other than just stand with me. We're going to get right into the opening song. And my hope and prayer for you this morning, for us all, is that you can reply yes to all the questions in this song. So as you're singing through it, singing the words, reading the words, have in your minds, yes, Lord. Have you been to Jesus with a cleansing power? Yeah. Stand with me, will you? Let's sing. Are your garments spotless? If we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, yes, they are. And if that means coming to the Lord Jesus Christ several times a day, I don't know, come to him and you can confidently say, yes, my garments, my soul, my heart, my mind, my mouth, my hands, my feet are washed in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. We're going to carry on singing. And the chorus of this little song sums up the um, Jesus story in a nutshell for me. You lived, you died, you rose, you opened the grave for the world to live again. Amen. Hallelujah, Lord, for what you've done. Let's carry on singing. Almighty forever, I 
Sometimes we just need to dwell. We just need to dwell in the moments and in the thoughts of exactly what you have done for me and for my friends here and for the whole world. Lord, you lived a very short life and a very powerful life that impacted so many. You died a horrible death, a painful death, a death of shame. But Lord, you broke the grave open. And Lord, we are so grateful that you broke the chains of sin and death for us. So Lord, maybe this week, a challenge for us all that we spend some moments just contemplating the greatness of that act. How much you loved us. And Lord, may we find the strength and the motivation and the courage, whatever it may be for us personally, to love you back and be assured of your saving grace and your mercy to us. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you that we get to come here again. Thank you for the week that has passed. And Lord, it is past, and we look forward to the week to come. Help us to walk into it with you. Bless this time, I pray. Bless your servants um, as things are done and said in this time that um, touch our hearts, Lord. Speak to us. May your Holy Spirit just move through this place. I pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now you may be seated. Whew. Okay, we. We's very precious to this place. Came in here many years ago and um, touched a lot of lives, actually. Initially, what should I say, we? Um, yeah. Um, I remember working in the front office when we started coming into this place, a very, very different man to what. He is today, and um, he's going to come now and um, share with us a little about um, the youth update and what he's doing. Um, yeah, your little sidekick, and don't know where he is. Thanks, we. Wow, God's good, isn't he? <laughs> See, I got my pen here, and I, 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 I had a card to write down my prep notes or what I was going to say when I got up here, but there's the pen. And I trust in God to give me the right words to, um, to speak today. It's a short pen, and hopefully it'll be a short <laughs> audio, okay? Kahi rawa, kahi rawa, te tangi ate manu nei, kui, kui, tui, 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 a. Ko tēnei manu, ko tu kai aia. Tui a ki runga, tui a ki ro, te raro. Tui a i roto, tui a i waho. <coughs> Karungo te pō, karungo te ao, i te pūkōrero, i te wānanga. Pū whiorangi, pū takataka, ko te marama ahuluku, ko te marama ahurangi. Ka taka tō koutou, i te ao tū, tū, tū wini wini, tū wana wana, tū i whakapūtāna ki te whei. 
katu numi e katu rawia fakoti nuku fakoti rangi katau manawa ko toku manawa e tane faka iri hia fano 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 mate ho fano mate ho ki haimi e hu e tai ki e e mihi ana o te mate nui na na nga me katoa e nga mate Hare, hare, hare atura. Te honga mate ki te honga mate, te honga ori ki te honga ora. Tēnā tātā katoa. Ka mi ki a koutou ngā whānau o te ope whaka ora ki whangarei. So what I just said was, in the beginning, it's a, it's a tau parapa, which is like a, like a, like poetry, directly from God, I believe. So it's about telling the story about God's creation, a bird, tu kai ai, you would hear that word, and about, I liken it to, in, in, in the Bible, it's about, um, you know, the dove that came down and rested when Jesus was um, coming out of the, uh, when John baptised him in the Jordan. No, anyway, anyway and, and some water, yeah. And down came that dove and to confirm that, you know, God said, I'm well pleased with my son. So, I believe that Māori, we use birds as in reference to God's creation, okay? People think it's, um, no, we're not witches or warlocks. <laughs> no, but, um, you know, we, we, we believe in the same God. And we might live a bit differently, have a better sun team. Yeah. <laughs> but we're the same in, in, in Christ, okay? And so today I'm going to, as, as part of the family ministry team, uh, who's Sarah Harrison, you might know she's our team leader, and we've got um, Paul... Paul, yeah, I'll leave it at Paul. <laughs> He's our um, a youth worker and, and was supported by Nathan and Naomi and the rest of the crew in here that do lots of different things. But I, I just want to sh- share um, a video that Green Bay College, we've been working um, uh, in different schools and Green Bay College were one of the schools that really left their doors open through all the COVID um, challenges. And I, and, and, and I actually um, attribute that to the people that work there and their really good management of the COVID effect and, and, and how to, you know, mask up and have, you know. I think that the worst they got, they got down to 65% of students not being in school due to COVID, 30 40% with the teachers. So, yeah, probably about, um, I don't know, nine months ago, we started going in there. You know, this is in... When you, this, these are outreach ministries in, the, in, in our community, okay? So, you know, we do church here on a Sunday, but every day of the week when we come in here, we do church here in, 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 in a sense of connecting with people, building relationships, being the example of Christ. Wow, that's a tough one. You know, that's a tough one. Anyway, we'll leave that there because there's lots of different... Um, everyone's got their own uh, example of the toughness of... Um, being that example every day in Christ. Reading his word, praying, being a nice fella. So we've got a video. I'm just mindful of my time. We've got 10 minutes. Ooh, it's about five minutes, I think. No. Anyway, we're going to listen to, we're going to, um, Ken's going to play us this beautiful video that they made at the college to see what we do out there. So. With one heart and one message. That the love of God will bring us all together. Oh, oh. 
You know, I just want to acknowledge uh, the leaders of this call, um, the territorial leaders, the Jeff Farm uh, project. I don't know whether you've heard of that. They're a, a, a co-papa or program that um, is agriculturally driven, but they, uh, their, their outcomes are targeting young people. And so, in, in, out of just going in there, I, I, how this started was I was invited to a, a community um, who we out there on bullying at school, it was that bad out there, and they said, oh, what can we do about it, and, and I was sitting there, and one of my friends goes, oh, why don't you charge the soup and the fry bread, so we started soup, fry bread, we feed 200 youth every week, and, and I just want to acknowledge our leaders, the divisional leaders, our territorial leaders for being able to give us the resources, um, you know, because it's, 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 it costs money, but um, what I see, God, God's doing the work out there, okay, we, used to, we turn up, as Salvation Army, as people that love God, and then we're prepared. I was reading in, in Matthew this morning about being, um, we have to be like, you know, men and women ready to, to move forward, you know what I mean? Like uh, John the Baptist, ready to courageously stand up, you know, and uh, every day I pray, Lord, prepare me for the good works you have prepared for me today. How about we make that a common prayer for all of us? Can I do that? Can I hear any hands of support there? Every day, Lord, I pray that you prepare me or us for the good works you have prepared for us today. And you know, you know, I've been praying that prayer for like, I don't know, about and you, you actually don't see the good works till it's already finished, if you're prepared. You know, sometimes you mightn't see it for, till later, but it, every day is an opportunity to... Uh, Share the love of Jesus and um, Green Bay College is just one of the schools. There's uh, Whangarei Boys High School, we just uh, Whangarei Intermediate. There was the Aspire program in there. Some people that know it, and what is, so we've got three different. We've got a, and, and, and not just making the super, we get, every week we have four young people coming to the kitchen, and I call it mentoring in the kitchen. Life skills, I get to talk to them. As you can see, there's community buy in. We've recruited some volunteers to come and help in those spaces, and I believe that's what, you know, that's uh, how God works in his kingdom is bringing everyone in to do his work. It's time for our child sponsorship offering. And we never quite know how to um, orchestrate this at the moment because the children used to run around and collect coins and we're not supposed to do that at the moment because of bugs and spreading things. So our little buckets are here. So if you would like to come, mind the step. Um, with your loose change... And um, as you do, remember our beautiful children that we sponsor from um, overseas. And it's a real privilege to help them out all these years that we've been doing this. Um, I don't know how much. I don't know how much we've raised. No, no. But we just 
keep giving and keep believing and keep trusting that God is using that money to um, better life in some way for those lives. So just come as we listen to the music. Thank you. Lord, we thank you for the money that has been given this morning for these beautiful children um, that we don't, we don't know personally, but Lord, you do. You made them. You made them in your image, and therefore, we just embrace them and help. We want to help where we can. So thank you for the people that do work in these places, in these countries, that just... Um, Oh, are so lacking in so many things and life is just so much harder. But for some reason we see their beautiful faces and know that they're happy anyway. And um, we just want to contribute um, financially to their villages, to their families, to their lives, to their education, um, whatever may be required. Lord, help us to just um, think of these little children, um, yeah, as as we prepare to give each month in the way that we do. Thank you for this opportunity, Lord. Amen. Before Captain Nathan comes to um, share the word this morning, we're just going to sing through another beautiful song, and I just want to bring your hearts, um, if they aren't already, and just into that atmosphere of um, trying to block out the world and concentrate on Jesus. And just following what we just said a few minutes ago of uncertainty and um, having the courage to just move forward, um, this was the little quote that's been on my phone for a very long time that I was just, um, it was just came before me this morning and challenged me to share it with you. And it says this, embrace uncertainty. Some of the most beautiful chapters in our lives won't have a title until much later. Isn't that just so true that we go into so many circumstances in our lives not knowing what on earth God is doing? And yet we look back and we see Jesus. We see Jesus everywhere. So we're just going to spend a few moments soaking in these beautiful moments, uh, these beautiful words of I speak Jesus. And I want to invite you, you can stand and sing with us, you can listen, you can do whatever you want, whatever God is leading you to do, but just be embraced by Jesus in these moments. Speak 
situations to you, Lord. And we pray against situations that you do not create. Lord, there's so much depression. There's so much hurt in this world. And Lord, it creeps into our families, into our lives. Lord, and then it's coupled by complacency, Lord, and we just get comfortable with the situation. But Lord, we know it's not right. So help us to speak Jesus every day. Thank you, Father, for the privilege that we have to do that. 
thank you that we have the knowledge to do that. I just pray that as we ask you to speak into our situations, you're asking us to give our lives to you fully, completely. In order to see change, maybe that change needs to start with us. So Lord, if that's the case, help us to be strong. Help us to move forward, not knowing the certainty of what our future brings. But Lord, we do that with you and we speak the name of Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen. Okay, so Jesus is walking, and he comes up to a field, and he sees that it's like there's like white paint on the ground, and it's just like this big box, um, and he sees that there's like these goals set up, and he, he walks up, and this Pharisee is just like, oh, hey, Jesus, you're here. Come on over. We're going to start now. So Jesus walks up, and the Pharisee's like, okay, so I'll pick first. Um, I'm going to take the guy that is dressed just like me. Like, he looks like me, walks like me, talks like me. I think I'm going to take him. And then Jesus is like, all right. Um, well, there's a teenager over there in a fishing boat. I guess I'll take him. And the Pharisee is like, cool. Um, I'm going to take this uh, Levite here. He's professionally trained. He's got all the things going, so he's going to be on my team. And then Jesus is like, um, I guess I'll take the prostitute. It's like, all right. And then the Pharisee's like, all right, so I get the next pick. And then he picks, like, I got this rabbi. And the rabbi comes. And then Jesus is like, um, I'll take the tax collector. Uh, yep, you come on my team. Uh, and then the Pharisee's like, all right, I pick this. And it just goes back and forth, back and forth until everybody's picked. All right, and the Pharisee goes over and he brings his team. And he's like, look, guys, have a seat. He's like, we're the best. All right, we're the best trained we're, we're the best equipped. We're clearly the best dressed. Like, we've got everything going. You guys are the best of the best. I've picked the cream of the crop. Like, they got a guy with the shriveled hand over there. He's not, he's not going to be useful at all. And it's like, we're just going to beat these guys. Where'd they go? And they turns around, and like, Jesus and all those guys, they're just gone. And the Pharisee's like, we win. We won. And the team gets up, and they're, like, high-fiving each other, like, yeah, we won. And then he gets up, and they go with this whole, like, a parade, and the confetti's, like, and it comes down, and they get a trophy. And the Pharisee's, like, I just want to give a shout-out to, like, we put in so much hard work, and we've done all this training, and it's all just really paid off because we won, and we just, we did it. So we'll see you next year. We're going to take the summer. We'll train hard again. We'll, we'll be back. Uh, where we are in Matthew is where we start to hit into the parables. All right, so um, each of the gospel writers uses the parables in different ways. Um, and, uh, and today we're just going to talk about what parables are and what they're used for and how we should approach them. Um, now, your homework, unfortunately, is going to be to read. Uh, sorry, John. Um, so you're going to have to read this week. So um, your homework will be to read chapter 13 of Matthew. Um, and and we're, I'm going to try to equip you for, I'm going to try to prepare you for that. Okay, so what's a parable? Uh, a parable is an ancient art form that was commonplace in first century uh, Palestinian oratory cultures. So um, they're narrative stories that are broken on purpose. All right, if they don't get broken, they're just a story. So, like, as an example, when I was, like, eight, 
my sister and I, so I grew up in Michigan, and Michigan has a lot of snow. Every, summer, every winter we get snow, and we, would, we had sleds. So they're just like large plastic bowls, basically. Um, and so we'd take the sleds, and we'd go find a hill, and you'd just sit on this plastic bowl and sl- go down the hill. And that's what you do all winter. Um, and so I, my sister, Colleen, she's 18 months older than me, and she loves me to death. Um, she thinks I'm the best person in the world. I can say that because she's not here to correct it. Um, and so, so she, she sits down, and I'm like, go. And so where we were, we were at, um, we were at Coit Park. And it's down a hill, and at the bottom of the hill is basketball court. So it's pretty wide open. The only thing there to hit is the basketball hoop. Now, what do you think my sister did? So she gets down, and she's going, and I'm, I'm watching from the top, and I'm like, oh, she's going to hit it. And she, sure enough, goes down, and the sled hits first, and then her momentum takes her forward, and she's like, Bong! and just like head on the pole, and then she's just laying there. Now, I was laughing, because why wouldn't you? Um, it's my sister. And I eventually, I run down the hill, and I'm like, are you okay? And she's like, we're never going sledding again. And she made me carry the sled home, and we had to go home. And then I spent the next year being like, come sledding with me. It won't happen again. Because I was little, and my mom was like, you can only go sledding if Colleen goes with you. And it was like a year of being like, just go sledding. There's no way that happens again. And she's like, it will. And I'm like, just come on. And then she's like, fine, we're going somewhere else. So we go somewhere else. This place is called Lookout Hill. It's much bigger. It's much steeper. All right? But there's no basketball courts down the end. All right? So she was fine. It's just softball fields. And they've got like a fence there. And fences don't hurt as bad as poles. So she's like, all right, I'll go. And I went a whole bunch of times. And she was like, I'm just going to watch. I went a whole bunch of times. And I was fine, you know? And then she goes. <laughs> and what happens when you're sledding is you get caught in the previously laid paths, all right? And there just happened to be one path that led off toward a pole. <laughs> and she never went sledding with me again. <laughs> now, that's a story. Right? And it's because there's nothing in there that like breaks the story. So it's not a parable, it's just a story. Now then there's then there's things that are a story that gets broken, but a parable breaks it on purpose. Whereas things that don't break it on purpose are like anti-jokes. Do you know what anti-jokes are? So an anti-joke is like, what did the what did one Frenchman say to the other? I don't know, I don't speak French. Uh, what did my grandpa say just before he kicked the bucket? He said, hey, how far do you think I can kick this bucket? (laughs) What is cold and white and ruins breakfast? An avalanche. (laughs) It's not funny, it's sad. So anti-jokes are things that imply that you're about to hear a joke and then crushes you because it breaks it and is like, no, this isn't a joke at all. This is a very serious avalanche. Many people lost their homes. And you were going to laugh? No, so, so that's, what a, that's what an anti-joke is, and it's not a parable because we're not breaking it for any other purpose than to crush your hopes and dreams that you're about to hear a joke, okay? That's the purpose of anti-jokes, whereas the purpose of parables is that they are purposefully breaking the joke. All right, so um, why do we use parables, or why did Jesus use parables? So there's a lot of recent studies that have happened trying to explain why. Uh, When you do your homework, you'll interact with Matthew. Matthew just blatantly explains um, why why the parable uh, is there. Um, One one recent study talked about the idea that we withhold story way better than than, than the way we withhold information. So when you're fed information, you compute it in a certain way, you store it in a certain way. But when you get a narrative, you you see it in a different way, you compute it in a different way, and you store it in a different way. So like the information that I got the the two days that my sister sledded into a pole, I don't remember. 
I don't remember any of that information, but I will never, ever forget seeing her fly into that pole because it's a visual thing. All right. There's, uh, so we, we compute narrative and story in a different way. So there's a lot, of, a lot of scholars that believe that one of the reasons Jesus used parables is because you'll remember the story. You won't just remember the rule he's trying to communicate. Right. Now, um, so that's one thought. And another recent study was really interesting about it studying stand-up comedy. Um, and what, what this study showed is that they believe that stand-up comedy is the most honest form of media. And one of the reasons it's the most honest form of media is because for comedy to be funny, it's got to be at least partly true. There's got to be some truth to it. And what stand-up comedy does is it introduces you to a concept that is usually true, and it makes you choose between laughing and being offended. You don't actually have neutral... That's, if, if you don't like stand-up comedians, it's because you find them offensive, but that's kind of their job. All right? Every joke forces you to choose. Do I laugh now or do I get mad? And that's why stand-up comedy tends to be very, very honest because what they're doing is taking things that are true and pointing out how real and silly they are. And then we have to go, oh, I do that. Do I think it's funny or am I mad, right? So, so comedy does that and, and stories do that and they interact with different parts of our, our brains. Um, like, all right, so one day... I was in a core, and I was standing in the foyer doing nothing at all, as you do, you just stand in a foyer, um, and I saw a group of young people standing on one side of the foyer, and they were talking about music that they liked that just sounds like a bunch of noise and repeats itself for what seems like hours and hours, and they had weird haircuts, and their jeans all had holes in them, and they were all just hanging out, okay? It was like a posse. And then from the other side of the foyer comes in this... Uh, this regimented line of old people, okay? They were, they were marching. Um, they had a guy with a bass drum, and it was like, do, do, and they were be and they all wore matching outfits, and they were perfectly pressed, and their shoes were shined, and they had no hair at all, even the women, and it was, you know, like just everything was perfectly uniform, okay? And the two groups stopped, and they were facing each other. And the leader of the old guard stepped forward, and he said, hey, we've been thinking, We'd like for things to be about you from now on, okay? We'd like there to be fancy lights and fog in the room for no reason. We'd like to have drums that are hit way too hard and never on beat. Uh, we'd like for these things to be happening. We'd like to see your ripped jeans on the stage. And, um, and then the, the group of the leader of the young people stepped forward and he said, well, actually, that's funny because we were just talking about the same thing. You see, we think it should all be about you. We think we should have more songs that are sung from books. All of them should be sung too high for any modern man to sing. Um, we believe that we should never know whether there's gonna be an introduction or not. Um, we'd also like for there to be gaps between verses so that the cornet row can have a nap. <laughs> no, 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 the old guard said. We want there to be bridges for songs that all just build up the same way, and we never know if they're actually about this song or not. We want to clap the entire song, not just the chorus. We want to hear acoustic drums beating out to the boom of a big, boost, uh, big bass guitar. We would want to be told to put our hands in the air without any real understanding of why. No, said the young people. We want to utilize these weird names like songsters. We want to, you know, get back to all these things. No, we want to play completely unnecessary sounds through our amps just so that we have to listen to. Why? We don't know. No, no, no. We want to sing outdated theological concepts that, have been, that we haven't had for over 100 years, but we keep singing them because we like the tune. No, we want to sing theologies of why we sing the song that we're singing without any sense of irony at all. And it just goes back and forth and back and forth, both groups just encouraging each other, both groups just wanting to be at all for each other. It went on and on, and, and it just was like, no, no, we want it. And then Jesus walks through the door and he goes, oh, sorry, guys, sorry I'm late. You know, was just helping some fella left for dead on the side of the road, you know, that old chestnut. Um, haven't been here in ages anyway. Wanted to see what's happening here. And both groups go, oh, Jesus. We had no idea you weren't here. So Jesus goes, right. Cool. So 
do you want me to be any part of this? All right, so another thing we have um, is when we're, when we're looking into parables and we're trying to interpret parables, we have to admit that there's an interpretive culture uh, shock for us. So it's something I've already touched on. Um, we are information education education. We are informationally taught people. All right, our education system is set up to provide us with information that we then kind of like repeat back. All right, so ancient first century Palestine and, and people that were part of that biblical culture, they did not think that way. They were not taught that way. Everything was oratory. Everything was story. Everything was narrative. I think one of the prime theological examples we have of that clash is the, uh, the, the modern, and it's a modern debate between the, the informational list of facts in the Genesis account of, uh, of creation versus the narrative concept of it. Is this a metaphor or is this a list of facts? Now, the reason that's a modern clash is because it's only modern people who, in, who insist on thinking of, I just want the facts in order. Now, that's how we're all taught. That's the education system we all grow up in. It's okay that we think that way. We just have to admit that we think that way. And when we're interacting with things like parables, that's not the point of them. They are not meant to be taken as factual stories of things that actually happened. If they did happen, that's fine. If they didn't, it's not the point. The point is the point being made in the narrative, right? Because there wasn't actually a breakfast where an avalanche came. It's just funny to think about it. Um, and so that's, that's one of the clashes. But then there's also, um, so in a parable in our context is a story that includes an element that purposefully breaks that story. Um, parable is the word para, which means alongside, and the word bowl, which means to throw, which is where we get the word ball from. Um, and parable means to throw alongside. It's a concept that is supposed to go alongside something and teach us something new. Okay, parable within our context is a brief fictional narrative to communicate a specific teaching. Parable within the context of the Bible was an art form. Okay, it was commonly used by rabbinic teaching. Um, Jesus of Nazareth, even outside of Christian religious uh, studies and, and circles, was considered a genius when it came to parabolic teaching. He was very, very, very good as an art form. It was only like the 60s when someone started to suggest, what if we see this as an art? What if we see this in the same way you see stand-up comedy? It's an art form. All right? and, and that kind of changed the way we started to look at it because we, as Western, modern Western people, we're looking for what's the information? What's the exact thing I'm being told? Um, and so there's that, there's that cultural clash. Now, um, it's another cultural clash is, is context. So I grew up in the Midwest United States in the, in the 90s. Um, now, any, anyone of my age who grew up in my part of the United States during the 90s um, grew up with Saturday Night Live and, and Chris Farley era and Tommy Boy. Tommy Boy was the greatest movie ever made. Just kidding, it's not. You shouldn't watch it. Don't take time out of your day. You don't get that hour and a half back. Um, but but it was, it's a movie that everyone my age watched, and it was a bad movie, but it was chock full of just funny one-liners. All right? And everybody my age had those one-liners that were part of everyday life for us. And so Anytime something happened, you had a reference because it was Tommy Boy. Now, I then moved to New Zealand, okay? And I came here, and uh, whenever I sat down for dinner, I would say, what are we having, chicken or chicken? <laughs> and people would go, what? And anytime I wasn't allowed to have something, I'd be like, hey, is there any more of that? And they'd be like, nah. I'd be like, all right. Guess I'll just have a sugar packet or two. And then if anyone was being weird about something, I would say, did you eat a lot of paint chips when you were a kid? <laughs> Zola did. And the proper response for anybody who understood that would be, <laughs> why? And if I knocked on a door and I knew the person inside, I would knock on it and say, Housekeeping, you want me for pillow? 
all right? And that, that was funny. And then what I was expecting to happen, would, if, there, if something happened that I wasn't expecting, I would say, well, what kind of a hotel is this? Now, in New Zealand, none of those things are actually funny because none of you have seen Tommy Boy, nor should you, um, and none of you understand. Like, but that was common stuff where I came from. So my whole first, like, 20 years in New Zealand, I still just make these Tommy Boy reference, and people are like, why does he keep talking about sugar packets? <laughs> because, like, every place has its context, all right? You have things that are funny to you because you grew up with them. And you say them to me, and I go, huh? And you have to go, oh, yeah, you're not from here. This isn't funny to you, all right? So we understand that. We understand that context. And, uh, and the, the Bible is, is the same, and parables are the same. Um, so we're going to use an example in Matthew uh, 13, the start of Matthew 13. And uh, that same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into the boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Um, then he told many things in parables, um, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering his seeds, some fell upon the path, and the birds came up and ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up and the plants were scorched, and they withered because uh, they had no root. The other seed fell on thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop 160 uh, or 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Now, we read that, and we think that's interesting, all right? Now, any farmer in the room, is, who's a farmer? Nat? Hey, what's your last name? McDonald? <laughs> that, one's too, that one's too easy. Um, now... I, I've never been a farmer, but I do understand enough about farming to know, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that if you're a farmer and you want to grow a crop, you don't just go out and just scatter your seed. And you especially don't do it if it's like there's a path, like I'm on the sidewalk. And you know there's a bird problem that you're not dealing with, okay? And you know that there's just like that, that patch over there is just rock, it's like a little bit of dirt and rock. As a farmer, if you're trying to grow a crop, you don't, you don't, put, you don't plant there. And if that's like all thorny and weeds and stuff, you're not just like, best of luck, all right? You're like, we understand, most of us can understand that if you're a farmer and you're trying to grow a crop, you prepare the ground. And that's what breaks this parable. Okay, so he's like, the kingdom of God is like a farmer who's just like, Let's hope for the best. And everybody there would have been going, no. No, we prepare the ground, and we only plant it where we know it's going to grow, and we get rid of all the stuff that's not, that we don't want. And if there's these people, we don't want them. And if there's these people, we don't want them. And if these can't, and then, he, and then they go, so you don't do that. And he goes, exactly. The kingdom of God is not like what you're doing. Exactly. So when you understand context, all the parables make a different sense, right? Because we understand what he's saying here. And, um, and as you get into Matthew, I need to warn you, because Matthew tells parables like, now I'm, gen I, I'm obviously stereotyping here, he tells parables like I assume a tax collector would tell jokes, or like, you know, an accountant would tell a joke. You know, he's like, why did the chicken cross the road? And we're like, why? And he's like, to get to the other side, because that's why you would cross the road, you know? Like, you would, because if you, if you were going to cross the road, you'd do it, because there's stuff you want. And it's funny, because it's a chicken. Why is there a chicken anyway? All right? And, and he thinks the explaining of all that is still part of the joke. Like, this is why it's funny. And we're all going, yeah, we, we get it. But it's a chicken. All right, so that, that's, now that's how Matthew, you're going to read it, that's how Matthew deals with the parables. He takes out 
all of the guesswork, and he just goes, here's the parable of Jesus, here's exactly what it meant, here's why he did it. Okay, so just warning you, as you read through this week, that's what you're going to interact with, don't be mad at me, it's Matthew's fault, okay? But now, the parables are all shared because the author's trying to prove points. And Matthew always wanted to make sure that his point was very, very clear, which is why he insists on explaining them. So, so then Jesus comes through the doors, and I'm like, hey, Jesus, welcome. And there's somebody I really wanted to introduce you to. So why don't you come up on here, um, and I'd like to introduce you to Manny. Manny is sitting here on this chair. Um, now, Manny, as you can see, is, is he's attending you know, he's here, and he is at everything. He attends everything. And as you can see, we've put Manny in a uniform, but, like, he's wearing, like, slippers and no tie. So it's, like, modern uniform, you know? Like, it's, like, hip and with it. Um, and Manny, like, Manny, he works really hard, and he's an amazing listener. Like, man, it, like this is Manny. He's such a good listener, and he'll just sit for hours and hours and just listen to anything anyone has to say, and he'll just give them all the time in the world. And he's like the first person here every morning, and he's the last person to leave, and he's always helpful. And like we can just put him in, in the back, and he'll just sit and, and listen to people as they you know, have their tea and coffee. And he's just like, he's just so, he's such a valued new member of our church, and it's just fantastic to have him. And Jesus is like, oh. He sounds like, he sounds great. And he comes up and he's like, Jesus. And he's like, hey, Manny, it's good to, that's a mannequin. And we go, well, I mean, I mean, yeah. And Jesus is like, why, why do you dress up a mannequin like that? It's like, well, I mean, think about it. Like, he just, he'll listen for hours. And he's like, yeah. Like, he can't move or talk or interact. Like, he's just, he's just a mannequin. And, he's, and we're like, yeah, but he's like, he's always at stuff. And he just, he's here all the time. Like, he literally sleeps in that closet. We just put him in when we're done. And Jesus is like, like I mean, oh my, he's like really heavy. It's like a heavy mannequin. And we're like, yeah, but like, because he takes part in youth group stuff. So he really gets tossed around, you know, like they... They just chuck him through and into things, and, like, he's fallen into the, into the soup a few times. But, like, you know, we just cleans him up, and he's ready to go. Man, he's just polish him up. And Jesus is like, what are you, it's a mannequin. What are we doing? What are we doing? And we're like, but he's like everything that we ever want in a member of our church. He never complains. He doesn't take up any of our extra time. Like he just comes and he sits and he's nice and quiet and he doesn't cause any trouble. And Jesus is like, his head comes off and he just pops it off. He's like, what is this? What's happening? And we're like, Jesus, Manny, he's, you got to be gentle. You got to be gentle with Manny. He's, he's sensitive. He's like, you just said he's not. He's like, yeah, but we still treat him. See, what we figured out, Jesus, is that if you have church people that have absolutely no human needs, it's much easier to do what this is. It's way simpler. And then Jesus is like, whoa, <laughs> okay. But you probably, you probably don't need me. So I guess I'll just, my, my team is outside. And it was a weird game <laughs> that we didn't know we were playing. But we had to pick a team. And then came here. And then I had this weird interaction between, like, the jets and the sharks out in the foyer. Um, it's a West Side Story reference. Is that just, okay. You go, some people are like, yeah, we get it. Uh, you know, and, and we had that weird interaction, and uh, you know, I realized I wasn't really needed out there, and then I came in here, and you've got Manny the Mannequin, who's your ideal, okay. I'm just going to go. And then Jesus goes, and we're like, well, it wasn't really the reaction 
I expected, but I think we won. High fives, everybody. Well done. Because another thing that you find in the parables is that often it's not just one parable. There will be connecting parables. So anytime you find in the Gospels where it's kind of sections of parables, they're always connected though, when, they're, when they're in those sections. And they all have their own truths in them, but all of them are also a deeper truth that they all encompass. So as you're reading through the Gospels and you read through the parables, it's never just one story. It's always like, okay, there's a deeper truth, there's a deeper truth. So you have, you know, you have your cultural lenses that we have to shift because we weren't taught to think that way. You have to understand that this is a story that's supposed to be broken. All right? It's not just the story of my sister. And uh, you know what? That lives in my heart forever, that story. Uh, but the story of my sister hitting her head on that pole, it's not just that story, and it's also not just an anti-joke. Like, there are stories that are breaking on purpose. You're supposed to be challenged. And similar to stand-up comedy, you either have to agree with this or be offended by this because parables don't really leave a middle ground. Okay, when you understand the culture of the parables and the culture that they're being taught in, it gives you a deeper understanding of those things, like the farmer with the sower, understanding that when they say the kingdom of God is like this, the people going, well, not my kingdom, and Jesus goes, yeah, exactly. That's the point, okay? And then you understand that, like, when they all are told and they all work together, you go, oh, there's a deeper truth here. So you guys see how you guys see how all that worked? You got Jesus coming through the field. Now one of the one of the art forms of it is to is to make the first one easier to like, you know, it's easy for us to dislike the Pharisees, right? So in the first story, it's like, oh yeah, those guys, and it's easier. And then you kind of like as they do, they develop it until it's like, no, it's me standing here on stage. Yeah, and you develop the deeper truth, and it's the more personal truth. All right? Because when we interact with the Pharisees, it's easy to just see them as a bad guy. When we interact with a foyer, it hits, hits home a little bit different because, you know, like, I've literally been in that conversation. All right? And then when we, when we you know, have, have Manny the mannequin, it's been another step because I've been taught that that is the ideal churchgoer. And I've taken part in church my entire life. Um, and those are the things that I was taught a good churchgoer does. But when I interact with Jesus' teaching through the Gospels, when I study the parables of Jesus and how Matthew uses them, when I'm willing to admit that, it's, that I possibly don't have it all figured out, and that we as a people haven't suddenly figured out all the truths of the gospel in a perfect way, when I start to be able to admit that, um, you know, I can, take a look, I, can, I can take a good hard look at myself and I can think, well, did I win? Or was I never actually supposed to be taking part in a game in the first place? So we're gonna sing, we're gonna sing some more together. Um, I'll get the music team to come back up. And the song we're going to sing is, is, is one where we have to make a choice. The song is Give Me Jesus. And so today, I have to decide if I'm going to spend another week playing weird Christian games or if I'm going to finally just settle for Jesus being enough. Um, am I going to take part in the battles of who this is for or who this isn't in for or how do we share that? Or is Jesus actually going to be my focus? Am I going to spend another week dressing and carrying around Manny the Mannequin? Or am I going to respond to the Jesus that says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I'll give you rest? The Jesus that says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And when I wake up every morning this week, 
Am I going to play the game? Am I going to fight for who this is about? Am I going to carry a mannequin around? Or is my prayer going to be, give me Jesus?
else can say those words for you. It's totally up to you. I choose to say, give me Jesus. What do you choose today? Thank you for these moments that we've spent together today. And Lord, I thank you for the one that kneels before you this morning. Lord, I pray that you will just bless Grace. Lord, that you would fill her, you would touch her, you would just surround her and meet her where she needs you. Lord, us, Lord, I pray that we will um, continue to help support each other in prayer. Help us to not be afraid to go to one another. Go and ask someone when we're needing some help and to say, I need you, Jesus. Thank you for a church family and the privilege that we have of loving each other and surrounding each other and supporting each other. Lord, I thank you for, um, for Nathan this morning as he shed a bit of light on um, some of the, the parables that we've known and been taught for years. But Lord, I thank you for a new light that has shine. Lord, some new teaching that comes and blesses us. Lord, as we um, pick up your word this week, and we once again read maybe some familiar words, I pray that you would just shine a different light on them and challenge us maybe in a different way than ever before. Lord, thank you for this time spent here, and I do pray for those that aren't here with us today, that you would look after them, bless them, heal them. Lord, I pray that if they're just not here because they just can't be bothered coming, Lord, if that's their reality at the moment, I pray that you would give our people a new desire to come and meet with each other, Lord, and be encouraged at the beginning of another week to go out and spread Jesus. Thank you for this time, Lord, and we ask all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So speaking of going out, we're going to go out on a bright note this morning and the band is going to lead us through our final song. 
as we sing these words, I believe Jesus saves and his blood makes me whiter than snow. We started this way this morning. I chose the opening song and I chose the closing song. And um, it was actually my sister that pointed out to me about the same theme that's running through, that Jesus' blood that he shed on the cross makes us whiter than snow. So we are going to revisit those words as we head out the doors this morning, maybe for a cuppa. I don't know what else is planned for your day, but I do pray God's blessing over you and yours, um, that you would be safe, that you would be protected, that you'd be challenged this week, that you would look for the opportunities and not just wait for everything to fall at your feet, perhaps. The other thing I've forgotten this morning is the opportunity to give your tithes and offerings. So if you would like to do that, just over to the side here is our tithes and offerings basket. Please feel free and blessed as you do that as well. Let's sing. Let us sing of his love once again. him all creatures here below praise him above ye heavenly hosts praise father son and holy ghost amen go with god whanau go with god amen